Today, in Dumb Movie Monday, we're going to be taking a look at uh, a movie about cell phones killing people. It's called Cell. The movie starts out with a whole bunch of people on their cell phones, just to showcase the audience how many people use their cell phones and how many cell phones are connected at any one time. It's also based on the book by Stephen King, which I've not read. The screenplay is by him and some other guy, so I'm guessing since he put something on it, it's going to turn to ash. For whatever reason, whenever he writes books, they're wonderful. And some of them are eh, but they're still okay. Whenever he touches movies, they turn into a freaking skeleton and then whisk away into a pile of ash and then blow away into oblivion, perhaps choking and closing off people's respiration on the way out. It was directed by Todd Williams. This guy kind of sort of did four works. I don't know what's going on with Stephen King Cell, it's the same thing as this, yet it didn't do anything. I have no idea what that's about. But let's just say he's done four movies. Technically three. The only one that did sort of well was The Door in the Floor, and I have no idea what that movie is. He did Paranormal Activity, which did okay, and then The Cell just plummeted below the earth, and he just fell off of the face of the earth after that. Anyways, everything seems all hunky-dory. Joan Cusack calls his wife or estranged wife. I'm not really sure what they are. She's jealous because she thinks he's seeing someone. He's like, no, I'm not. Then she's like, it's not that simple for you to come back because you've been gone for a year. His son wants to talk to him. And while they're in the middle of FaceTime, his battery died. Feels so bad because the little kid is like, dad, I just want you to come home. And then it cuts off right there. He tries to find a place to charge his phone. Everywhere is taken. So he tries to use a pay phone and then he runs out of money. Then shit hits the roof. <sighs> everyone just starts going nuts. Specifically, everyone who had a cell phone attached to them, like through their headphones or through the speaker, meaning the part that you put up to your ear. They not just go crazy, they just start attacking each other. John has no idea what the hell is going on. He tries to protect the girl by hitting this guy with a paperweight. This part was really horrible because this guy just starts eating his dog. Oh my God, I just wanted to cry. But then, <laughs> I was taken out of it because the sound effects that they use in this movie for some reason are so repetitive, you know it's fake. You know it's not actually really happening. So it kind of takes you out of the realism of it. And for that, I was like, okay, the dog's not really getting hurt. I always get myself lost in these movies because it sounds real. But the noises that the dog is making is like this audio loop of a dog sound effect that they're using. <laughs> Did you hear that? Normally I would never laugh at something like this. I'd be like, no, and I'd start crying and hold my dog. But it's so obvious that this is so freaking fake. I mean, I know it's fake because it's a movie, but you're supposed to you're supposed to make it in such a way that the people believe that it's real. And it's so easy for people to see that this is fake because they, for some reason, use not just the sound effect of this dog, but people screaming, certain things. It's just like, why are you using a loop? Like, if you're gonna use a loop, make it something long that was recorded for a minute. Don't use a five second loop of someone screaming. Jesus Christ, what were they doing? Anyway, this girl that decides to call her friend's parents or 911 or something, she also gets hit by the juju or whatever is in the cell phones that's making people nuts. And I swear to you, this part is so freaking dumb. Like, I didn't even understand. Like, when other people said they hated this movie, I'm like, I'm gonna give it a chance. Maybe there's something there that they just don't see, or to them, it's corny. But dude, look at... Oh my god, this is just this just made the adventure so much worth it after I saw this. <laughs> First of all, why does her voice sound like that? Like the way that they shot it, or the way that they want us to see it, is that she's hearing that in her head, but we're also looking at it from the perspective of John, the actor, the main character. So why does she sound like a radio? Do their voices just Sound like th I'm so confused. But check this out, guys, because it gets better. And what you're going to see here is fake blood. Trust me, it's all fake. Not that it's real in other movies, but y you'll, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> okay. So the only scariest part of the movie with me for me was 
when this big ass dude just stabbed someone. He was the cook or someone in the kitchen. Of course, you can see he has his headphones in. I don't know how it's possible his earphones are staying in. That's a really good brand of headphones or hair earphones. I can never say the right thing. Earbuds. Because my ears are so tiny. Like, it's so hard to find a proper thing that will stay in or even go inside of it. But even now that I have found something for my ear size, being that I have freaking kitten ears, if I'm thrashing around like this, they're coming out, especially if I'm rubbing up on people and making jerky motions, but not this guy. And just watch, this is the most terrifying thing I've seen so far, even though it's kind of hilarious. <laughs> Oh God, this movie sucks. Like I want it to be real and it was, the concept is nice, but it's, it's it seems more like a parody or a satire to me. It doesn't seem like they're taking this seriously. My man tries to get a handle on the situation, but it's gonna be too late because then those things are gonna catch him. The cell people, I don't know what they're calling them yet. He puts on a hat to try and disguise himself, I guess. I mean, I guess that's what you would do when people are going nuts, put on a hat. Of course, whatever's happening on the ground is also happening in the air, and we see the aftermath of it when an airplane strikes another airplane or flying object. And of course, where does it go when it crashes? Straight into the airport where our main character is. Run, my dude! Run! <laughs> Run! Then our guy gets down to the substation or the subway and the little zombie cell phone people, they're really not zombies because they're not dead, but who the frick knows what's going on. They're just debilitated, just sitting there spazzing out, sounding like broken cell phones themselves. And we realize that there's possibly a correlation where they're not being a signal underground and them all of a sudden not being able to move. This is where we meet our next main character, the Sam Jackson man himself. Get out of here, we ain't going nowhere. Is there a driver on this train? Yeah, that'd be me. Can we leave? No. Okay. He lets everyone know that the train can't go more than 50 feet, but they can walk. And everyone's like, walking? What's that? Holy shit! Sam Jackson, who we know now as Tom, John Cusack, Mike Matt, and little Mikey here decide to go and take a walk through the substation so that they can get out the other side. The other people stayed on the train because they were paranoid that the train would start rolling with them on the track. But as old Tom said, if this doesn't blow over and this continues over 24 hours and nobody's manning the pumps, this whole thing's gonna get flooded. But you need to check on? Yeah, my boo. Did you say my boo? Yeah, what you got, huh? <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Oh, my man, he done left me, so. I ain't got nobody, I live alone. Good news is, he has no one to check on, so he doesn't have to use a phone. You know one of the things that I find hilarious about Samuel Jackson is he's so serious and badass, but then when he's in a situation where he's supposed to be scared, he sounds freaking hilarious. Ah! Ah! hilarious. I heard it in Deep Blue Sea as well. I j it just freaking kills me, dude. So, so they get to him. They get above ground and are fighting for their lives. These crazy ass people. Jesus Christ, this movie. That's when they realize that it's not just one local event. It's all over. And I like how they put Jesus saves in the corner. <laughs> like, bro. After he and Sam finally get to safety, John Cusack asks if he can borrow his cell phone to text his family. Unfortunately, when he texts back, this is what he gets in return. My thing is, did the person sit down there and text this in crazy language, or did they just happen to have the phone still in their hand, and with the jittery motions, they did this? Because those people look like they're out of their minds. I don't see them sitting down and replying to a text this way. You know, I could see this working better as an anime. Better yet, it kind of reminds me of something. Hmm. <laughs> they soon make the decision that they can't stay there. Us three are like bugs who had the dumb luck to avoid the stomp of the giant's boot. Now they've got this girl with them, nothing can go wrong with that. Little John Cusack decides that he is going to try and find his family, even though we're pretty sure that they are turned, but maybe his son is still alive. They very quickly learn through observation that these phoners, as they're called later, move in some sort of hive mind or flock like birds. 
They do move in herds. Basically, I have to survive being chased by these things and avoiding them, and then they get to someone's house who has a whole bunch of guns. They're making all of us look bad. I mean, they're not wrong, but Jesus Christ. These girls, presumably the owners of the house, and all the firearms, basically off themselves. Now they have a whole bunch of weapons to defend themselves. Do you wonder if they're still a little bit there because they find someone who acts so out of character from the others. This movie is so freaking weird. They call out to him, he's not saying anything, but yet he's holding the Papillon dog in his lap, stroking it, where others like him have eaten dogs whole. They call out to this dude several times and he doesn't answer. And then he decides that, you know what, I'm gonna wait till you get really close and then attack you. All of a sudden they're intelligent and have every idea of what is happening around them. Suddenly his homies just manifest from out of the trees like they're coming out from a different dimension. Really bro, you didn't see them before? The group run into a little snag when these things start chasing them. They're able to cap a few of them, but they can't cap all of them to hide. And then they realize that conveniently, there's a boat overturned that they can all hide in at the nick of time before the things find them. Good news. The things don't know they're under their boat. They have the intelligence, apparently, or what little is left, to trick them into a trap, which is what I'm assuming happened earlier, but they don't have the intelligence to look under the boat. Yet they look into the sun. And what happens next? I get it's supposed to be eerie, but it comes off so freaking hilarious. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about this movie, but it just freaking made me laugh. trying so hard but it's the way their faces look like their faces look like they're supposed to be yelling at the top of their lungs but what is happening right now and how is it that the human is able to make those noises okay you know what i'm not even gonna say anything because i know there's people exist in the real world that can mimic people <laughs> Folks, I'll see you next Sunday evening. Uh, we're gonna have a Holy Ghost revival. Jesus, this movie freaking gives me cramps. But I gotta tell you, I think this movie is meant to be a comedy because their reaction after that entire spiel is exactly what I was thinking watching it. Goat, cow, rooster, you and me both. Anyways, the coast is clear for now as the phone is all... <laughs> phone is such a stupid name. They all gather together and head off towards the phone towers or something. I don't know what the frick they're supposed to be doing. Anyways, <laughs> they make it to this inn or this college or something and this guy greets them. This is where they... <laughs> Sorry, this is where we start to learn a little bit more about the phoners or the weird people. Here we meet our character named Jordan. Quite a problem these cell phones have caused now, isn't it? Wait a minute, wait. Did somebody write this because they hated kids using cell phones or people using cell phones? They're like, just let's, let's just, did Stephen King think about, I don't even know. I, I don't even, but okay, they could have written it better because it sounds so freaking weird. Like, quite a problem these cell phones have caused now. See, I told them children not to use them cell phones. Like, come on, dude, seriously. I don't think this guy is a horrible actor. I just think the lines that they wrote for him are a little bit paunch, whatever that means. The devil's intercom is what I used to call them. Okay, dude, whatever you say. Anyway, there's this music playing. <laughs> This is where it gets good. There's this music playing and the guy's like, as long as the music doesn't stop, we're fine. Or, you know, as long as it keeps playing. You want to hear what the music is that they're playing? This is what makes it even more funny. And it just gets worse after that. That's the music that's playing. But it gets weirder. Don't worry. You hear. Holy shit. Observe. What the hell are you doing? Is it so she screams at the top of her lungs to make a point. No, no, be stop, be stop. So he explains to them that if he tried this in the daylight, they would just eradicate him. Totally understandable. And this little boy is like, the music comes from their mouths too. Like seriously, like if you actually go up to their mouths, you can hear it. It's not as loud, but you can totally hear it. Come, come check it out, yo. Come down here. Like, dude, at, at this point, I'd be like, you know what? I think I'm just going to turn in for the night. Because the last thing I want is for these little sons of bitches to rip off my freaking ear. But of course, 
the main characters are dumb. So what do they do? They put their heads next to the people or the humans that are now like this. And oh, it's hilarious. Hey, talk. Come listen. movie what are you doing i feel like the whole thing is just one large comedy and they're changing at an alarming rate can we please move this conversation inside please <laughs> i can't do it <laughs> <laughs> John Cusack and his friends learn more about these phoners. And honestly, Jordan does the best job at explaining it. He's like the most likable character in this entire movie. Listening to their music, we think they're rebooting. I mean, they might as well have, you know, software updating, please stand by, blinking on their foreheads. What is a brain? It's, it's just a big old hard drive. Organic circuitry. Uh, no one knows how many bytes. Giga to the power of Googleplex. If your brain were an info strip on a hard drive, it would say something like 2% in use. 98% available. So basically that 98% is being used by something. Who knows? Maybe if you did have that 98% unlocked, people wouldn't make movies like this. At night, they propose that they kill them. I mean, the hive is all right there. Why not? So they take this fuel truck or whatever this is supposed to be. I guess it's a gas pump truck. And they just spray it over the entire field with all the sleeping phony phoners. It was actually the headmaster's idea. And then they set it aflame. <laughs> Unfortunately, they didn't account for the gas pump also leaking the fuel back towards where the truck was. It exploded and the poor headmaster, Ardai, dies. I know it sounds weird saying it, Ardai, die, but his last name really is Ardai. Ardai! Ardai! No! Help! Help him! Somebody help him! Tom! That's the saddest part of the movie. They leave the private school and all stop at an abandoned drive-in. And that's where things start to get more interesting. I don't know about you, it sounds like somebody is. Let's get it on. John Cusack gets up to see what the hell that could be because it sounds like another person. Is it? Oh my. Don't you knock? Then the guy makes the call signal like call me and then a weird phone dial up thing comes out of his mouth, just freaking weird. After they wake up, after John Cusack has his nightmare, they realize after sharing the experience that they all had nightmares that they actually all had the same nightmare of the same guy in this red hoodie with a tear in his cheek. John Cusack lets them know that the guy in the dream that everybody is dreaming about now that they've never seen is actually a character from his comic book, a prophet guy who had prophesied the apocalypse. Hey, it's just a comic book, man, unless this is just all my goddamn dream. When they walk outside, they see a pile of burning cell phones. Could it be those stupid phoner people who left it there? I mean, it could be the survivors, but now we have to watch our backs in this movie because when they burned the phoners alive in that field, they said they felt rage. Not the phoners, the, the survivors said they felt rage. Days later, our group gets to this weird TV looking bar. They see Kashwalk equal no foe. I heard Kashwalk, what does that mean? Maybe no foe means no phones. The tower's so it's safe. You can't assume that. It's too early to think we know the rules. Really, bro? But you, it wasn't too early to assume everything else up until this point. Freaking weirdo. Anyways, they take a knock to see if anyone's inside. Open up, we're Americans. Okay, <laughs> why is that a reason to open the freaking door? Well, they do get invited inside. Funny enough, this group of people are so freaking weird and one of them sounds like the phoners. Thank you. And you, my love, are to die for. <laughs> I'm dying. Up in Maine, it's an unincorporated area they call TR-90. This guy with the very disgusting hair plugs tells everybody else that's where everyone's going. That's where you're going to want to go. Because you always have this one venue where everybody goes when there is just a zombie apocalypse or every human turns on their fellow man. There's always just one place. There's never two, never three, just one. We're going to fast forward because there's a whole bunch of stuff that just is time wasting during this entire scene. But the other one was this one called Araman. And he was like um, the 
demon of uh, big data. Nobody cares! Nobody cares! The group all gets some shut-eye, but the weird creepy woman decides to go to the door when she hears some strange noises outside. Supposedly, the phoners are supposed to be asleep, but the headmaster did say that they would evolve to get up in the dark, just like the kingdom, just like all the other movies, you can't have nice things. She makes sure the door is locked, why wouldn't it have been locked before, and then she puts her ear up to the door, where she can hear the sound of the transmission from one of the phoners in her ear. As you can imagine, I was like, this makes no freaking sense, because if she can hear them from the other side of the door transmitting, then why is it that when they make that noise, when they're only inches in front of someone, that the other people don't turn into phoners themselves? But of course, it's this movie, she turns into a phoner. Our main character wakes up and he's like, why the hell is this woman standing up in the middle of the dark like this? He goes to see if she's okay, not realizing that there's creepy phoners already still waiting for him to come and take the bait. Chaos just ensues, all the hosts are killed, she transmits inside one of the other guy's ears and he turns into a freaking weirdo. Oh, this movie's making me tired. He leaps onto our main character like a Viking on heroin. And this entire time, these people are inches in front of these guys, but yet they don't turn into phoners. The girl that was with Sam Jackson and John Cusack shoot the guy that's on top of Sam Jackson so that he can get away. And then she gets like slammed in the head by the crazy lady. And uh, yeah, her lights are out. She's dead now. Everyone is sad for her passing when she finally dies when they carry her outside and then they bury her. Conveniently during these times, everyone is given enough time to do what they need to do to say goodbye to the character. It's sad, but never really near her. For some reason, it seems as though the raggedy man, as they call him, is watching. Notice how his eyes look almost identical to the girl's eyes. Our characters come upon a new group of people. Our man, Ray Heisenga, and Denise. And it doesn't take long to realize that Ray has something of a screw missing in his head. The phone on the red hoodie? They call him the president of the internet. Yeah. You gotta be taken down. Down. I mean, down, like, down, like, like, right there. You've got to take all the way down. I, listen, are you okay? When you notice a change in someone's behavior, no matter how small, trust your gut instinct. Ask, are you okay? Denise shows the group her brother. Her brother is a phoner who they caught. Apparently, the phoners are basically like normal people who were in a vegetative state. And whenever other phoners or the hive comes nearby, then they start to act up. So basically, they use him as a early warning mechanism. And then he starts twitching. This is why I can't stand some of the characters in these movies, because when something like this happens, you know. You're one of the smartest people of the group. Yet when something like this starts happening, you act so irrational and put everybody in danger. You see, the phoners have this thing. They are a hive mind. So whenever one of them sees something, all of them see it. That's why they know exactly where their prey is if one of them happens to lay their eyes on them. That's why little Danny boy here has a freaking hood over his face so that they can't see where these people are. But oh no, throw all caution and rationale to the wind for the sake of the plot. They can be rehab. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you coming home? Are you coming home? What the hell's going on? Are you coming home? I have no idea. He never said anything before. Are you coming home? Are you coming home? Now, you guys didn't see the whole thing, especially if you didn't watch this movie, but that's what his son, the main character, John Cusack's character, that's what his son said to him right before they got cut off. And he really wanted to see him. He asked if he's coming home and he really wanted to see him. And this is what's playing on repeat. How he knows what was inside of his head or the conversation they had. Maybe they were spying on the phone call or something. I mean, these are phone creatures that are now taking over these sucker humans. You would think that John Cusack's character would know this. He's pretty sure he does, but. Are you coming home? Are you coming home? I just want you to come home. Johnny's voice. No, it's not. I just want you to come home. Do not Are listen to that home? shit. You know that is not your son. Why would you take the hoodie off? You know it's not your son. He just said so. He is in a grown man's body. Like, what are you doing? You had that dream. You know how this works. You're the person who tells everybody how it works. Yet you gotta take the freaking hoodie off his head. You freaking idiot. I just want you to Clay, no! Hi, Dad. I love you, Daddy. <laughs> this movie's so goddamn dumb have to leave the area because now the hive mind knows where they are. The rest of the phoners are probably on their way already. By the way, if I forgot to mention this because my brain is slowly melting from watching this movie, Cashwack, the name that we saw on the bar, the place where apparently all the other humans that are normal go to for retreat and for safety is actually a trap set by the red hooded raggedy man. Ray gets out of the truck and he's not saying a word. John follows this guy who apparently hasn't gotten sleep in six days because he's been watching. You are it. What's that around your neck, Ray? I don't like it that you're holding on to your kid because your kid is done. Your kid is done. You, 
You, you know it and you're hot, but you can't toast. Ray decides to take one for the team because, first of all, he's crazy. He's batshit crazy. I'm pretty sure some of that had to do with him not getting any sleep. But he's like, dude, you're gonna have to leave the rest of them. I'm gonna blow myself up because it's too late for me. He already knows I'm seeing stuff. When the time comes, whenever that's supposed to be, movies always do that. Call the number on the back of this paper. You know the time. You got. I hope you know the time. What do you mean you hope he knows the time? What the frick is that supposed to mean? Why is everything so cryptic in these movies? I mean, seriously, this is the worst time to speaking parables. Even John Cusack asks him, what time is that supposed to be? And the guy's like, the end of the world time, the end of the road, you'll know. Like, dude, okay. Like, what, what, what I think we pass that a bit far back in the movie. Oh, mine, you better step away, my okay. friend. Okay. Yeah. Step away, Clay. <laughs> 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 So the first stop is Sharon's house. His ex-wife or his estranged wife, whatever their relationship's supposed to be. Can't blame him. I mean, you'd want to know too. Unfortunately, his wife is gone. But the good news is his son left a message saying, Dear Dad, I hope you're alive. Mom is one of them. I'm going to Koshwa. Please come. Love, Jonathan Gavin Rydell. Riddell. R what? Go ahead, Carvel. He never even got to tell his wife that he missed her. <laughs> Sam Jackson came in the nick of time to help him this red-headed, red-hooded, raggedy man that actually turned out to be. Oh no! His wife. Oh shit! John Kozak tells Sam Jackson what the plan was and what Ray told him to do. This is also bad, because remember, Cashwack is actually a trap that the phoners set for everybody else. So they are intelligent, or whatever is using their brains is intelligent. They also discovered that their late friend Ray had packed a truck full of C4 for a purpose. Maybe to blow up all the phoners if they're all in one place conveniently, which they will be later on in the movie. He gives the keys to the others and tells them that he's going to cash back because his son's going there and they should take his wife's wagon. One really smart thing he does is give the spray can to Jordan to say TJD, which is initials for the both of them, or for all of them, the rest of the group, to let him know that they're safe. Every couple of miles, if they do that, that means that John Cusack will know that they're still alive and he'll follow their trail. Good thinking, dude. I guess it's to redeem him from the stupid mistake he made earlier, putting them in danger. Every couple miles, you go off road, dirt road, put it up on a tree, always on the left-hand side of the road, because that's where I'll be looking. Aww. So the journey and the parting begins. And honestly, I like the change, the transition of the music here. That was really well done. Sounds like a marching band who all stubbed their toe at the same time. He sees some people on the way. I guess they're normal people because they're asking for help and they're also warning him to not go there. Or maybe not. He travels on in and hears a stampede, a very loud thunderous noise. You think it's a storm, but no, it's all of the phoners stampeding around this phone tower. Freaking creepy. Anyways, while he's there, he tries his best to look for his son, but he sees the raggedy man right in the middle of this seance. It seems as though the phoners don't even realize that he's there. The only person that does realize he's there is old red hooded raggedy dude. Looks like the demon possessed zombie version of Skrillex. He decides to kill him and the guy just stands there and lets it happen. Like, really? But then the stupidest part happens because all you gotta do is just keep running over this guy with the truck. But no, the main character has to get outside the truck because that's how we do things in movies. Let's go right up close to the guy while there's a stampede of these freaking phoners all around you. Then he shoots him point blank, which I understand but you do know, you could also done that from the truck. You could have stayed inside the truck and held it outside. I don't know what the symbol for those die in the sand is, but I'm sure it means something. He pushes his way through the phoners and amazingly, they don't even know he's there. He drops his shotgun and he tries to look for his kid. I don't know how he knew his kid, where he was or whatever, but he picked up some kind of signal or something and he's just desperately trying to look for his kid and all these hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people and he can't find him. Right when he decides it's the end of the world to dial the phone number on the cell phone, which we're guessing is tied to the bombs, suddenly, guess who appears before him? Oh yeah, Johnny. And you can tell by the way Johnny looks that Johnny is not Johnny anymore. I mean, the first thing a kid would have done seeing his father is, Dad! First of all, he wouldn't have been in that situation just being the only person who's lucid. I mean, this guy is not thinking clearly, but I get it. His emotions are running wild. He doesn't even realize it's not his son anymore. He grabs his son right by his ear, and holy crap, he realizes real soon that Johnny's not Johnny. Johnny starts to emit a sound. And I'm like, why isn't he changing into the phoners? Why aren't the phoners coming? Oh, they're all all yelling something is about to happen Yeah, he 
just blew up everyone. Or did he? Now he's with his son and he's all happy. He's like, I can't wait till you meet my friends. You're gonna meet my friends, Johnny. Johnny asks where his father's going. He says Canada. We already know this isn't real. This is a dream sequence, which makes you wonder, what's happening? Oh no! And we see our main character with the rest of the phoners. I don't know where Johnny is. I don't know if he ever even saw Johnny. I don't know if he even ever saw the red hooded guy. You have no idea what's real. This movie freaking sucks. Oh, look, the truck's still there. Nothing blew up. Maybe they took him out of the truck. Who the hell cares? This movie was weird and the concept was interesting. I think the execution could have been much better. It was way too hilarious and I just didn't take it seriously. A lot of things also didn't make sense. And again, that's okay if things don't make sense, but it has to be executed in a way that fits with the atmosphere that you're trying trying to set. Holy crap, ouch. Maybe these actors weren't right for the movie. Maybe the movie wasn't right for the actors. Who knows? But it was one of the dumbest movies I've seen. I mean, I've seen worse movies than this, but I feel like the movie was just a horrible amalgamation of comedy and horror. And it was even really bad because it wasn't trying to be funny. It would have been great if it was something like Shaun of the Dead where it was trying to be funny, but it wasn't. But it was just hilarious, which made it so bad. Anyways, there you go, guys. Cell phones are evil. Watch your ears. Thanks so much for watching. This has been Ulteriori. You ask, we answer.